Hey guys, welcome back. This is part four of Needle Felting the Zebra Diker. Okay, so we're going to put a little glue on these hooves and that's just to get them nice and secured and cured so that they don't come apart. So we only need a little dab of some Mod Podge. We don't really need glossy, any kind of matte would do. I'm going to use from the Dollar General decoupage, which is basically the same thing. I'm using the matte. And so we have our glue and then I have a little water and you're going to mix a little bit of water into your glue and you have, I have my eyeballs there. And just mix a little bit of water into your glue because it's a bit thick to apply. If you were doing it for wool, you would, I would usually do about half and half. Water and glue can be a little bit thicker for, for this because this is only um, the florist tape. Just getting a little dabbed on there and it doesn't take very long for this to dry. Just remember to lay it on its back somewhere don't stand it up or you might stick to whatever you have stood it up on. Don't be afraid to get it on there. Just pull your wool back. We haven't finished completely with these little feet. We'll have just a little bit of fiber left to put on when we go in with our fine details. But I figured it's time now at this point to go ahead and get our hooves cured. And you could put a couple of coats on if you want. I think one coat it probably will do it for such a small project. And the hooves, the wire inside the hooves are, is still flexible, so you can make it not quite so pronounced a V. Once it's dried, then you can put it how you need it to be in the end. It doesn't affect that. We're basically just putting a finishing coat onto that tape. So the tape doesn't dry out and unravel. There are many ways to do this. Like I said before, there's wax, um, and there is Powertex, and Serafina Fiber Art has a formula she calls SWAX. Uh, Mum's Makery has a type of modeling wax that they sell as well. Okay, so, oh, and there's also beeswax you could use. So these little horns, we're going to save these for the end. We're going to do anything with those just yet. Alright, it's time to get to stabbing again. I went ahead and between videos I finished out that last leg and just tightened things up a bit so we're gonna put the little belly on if you look in the picture chunky little things Of course there's many ways to approach this and I'm going to show a couple of ways and then the way that I decided on. 
You could just grab a chunk and lay it on there, but I find that you need more than one layer because it compresses down quite a bit if you were to do it that way, but there's nothing wrong with doing it that way if you wanted to build up layers. And if you have a multi-needle tool, that's always helpful as well. So what I decided to do is to roll it up and I'm looking at the picture. The chest is more prominent than back between the back legs. So I'm going to keep that in mind when I do my stabbing. Keep in mind when you do your stabbing, if you stab straight in, that compresses. If you stab at an angle, that sculpts. And my creatures don't tend to be uh, really firmly felted. They're felted well, they're just not uh, so firmly felted that they don't move. I like just a little bit of squishiness. Use the core wool for the belly because this is going to be covered up here in a minute with our top coat. So I'm using the Palomino, uh, it's a horse coat sold by Serafina fiber art. It's called Palomino, but you could mix this color yourself. You just uh, find some colors that would create that and mix it with a, a hand or with a carter. I always feel a little sorry for the sculptures at this point. It looks a little painful. It must be done. Nobody said their creation process was always pretty. You always want to make sure you're not freezing up your joints and keep those moving where they're supposed to be moving. You don't want to felt your arm down to the chest, for example.
You've got some fur on the belly. Next, we're going to build up the back. They have a pretty prominent bend in the back there where they're kind of hunched over. And you can get a little bit of that effect with the wire, but you really need to go ahead and build that up to really make it noticeable. So I'm just using some of my core. This is color of oats. But you could use the, you could use your um, off-white chunky core here. You could also use your top coat, but it would take a lot more top coat, and that's, this is just helping conserve the top coat to use your core, so. It's getting a nice shape. It's looking a lot better. I decided there needed to be just a little bit more there in the middle. It's okay to exaggerate some of these features a little bit, especially in a small sculpture. These aren't exact replicas. These are I don't want to say caricature, but they are a representation of the animal. So certain features that really stand out in the animal, you can um, take a little artistic license and make those a little bit more prominent. I decided to go ahead and work on the tail a little bit. It was kind of difficult to find good pictures of a tail of a zebra diker, but the pictures I could find had white underneath the tail, kind of like a white-tailed deer. So I'm just using my core. I didn't get a white top coat. I didn't find it necessary. This off-white chunky core works really good. It's light enough against the other skin for the whiteness to stand out. Or not skin, fur, the other fur colors. I'm just giving a look over. Seeing what is asking to be done next. Okay, so I think here I decide, let's get a little bit of his head formed. I'm going to keep everything in proportion. So I just roll up a little padding there. And if this was a bigger sculpture, I would probably definitely go for more shapes. And if you've watched any of Serafina Fiber Art, her videos um, she has wonderful ways that she stacks the shapes to make the face faces with the like the meat underneath the the faces but um, on a sculpture this small it's really not necessary you, you just kind of need to get the shapes and then it's more more of a sculpting type thing they're so tiny Now I'm going to make a piece here that's going to act as kind of a 
eye socket and a like a uh, skull ridge, I guess you could call it. So, I know my hands are in the way. <laughs> I like filming in the other direction because my hands don't get in the way, but the lighting gets really crazy if I've got the camera pointed the other way, so I had to compromise. But I'm just making a triangle here. And how you do it is up to you as long as you have a nice little triangle. The pointy end and end with fiber sticking off. So I'm just laying that, tacking the pointy end to the end of the nose because we're going to do more at the end of the nose later. So I'm separating it here and I'm going to bring it around the jaw. And this is all experiment. I haven't made one of these types of animals before. I'm just going with what I've done on other things, what has worked and sometimes experiments work and sometimes they don't and you have to rip it off and start over but I think this one worked pretty good. So I just separated that and I wrapped it across on the outside of the face there and tucked it up under the chin. So that's kind of acting as the skull and the eye socket and part of like a jawbone sort of. And all of this will get finessed. I spend the most time, I think, on my faces. And the way the face starts out is never the way the face ends. Even when you think it's finished, I'll put it away for a few days and then look at it again and I'll see maybe an eye. It's really hard to get eyes exactly the same. So it will do tweaks, little tweaks here and there. And then at some point it'll say, that's good, I'm satisfied. All right, so I'm looking to see where the eyes are located in relation to the head, in relation to the horns. And there's many different types of eyes. You could use glass eyes. Um, I get these really wonderful glass eyes from Living Felt. I haven't used them very much. I just got kind of a multi-pack with different sizes. Um, I've only used them a couple times, as a matter of fact. There's, that's a clear, they also have different colored. Um, I much prefer using wool for the eyes, but I have started experimenting here and there on certain animals that look better with the glossy eye. And there's also, at your craft stores, you might can find some plastic eyes um, if you're just getting started and playing around but I think I'm gonna use wool for this guy I'm much more comfortable with the wool you can do so many things with it you can really make the eyes on certain animals that have really beautiful colorful eyes you can really do some amazing things with the wool so I'm just rolling up a piece I'm rolling it down, then rolling it the other way, and I'm sticking it right in there, in that socket that we made. And I know it looks goofy and large and huge, but later on we're going to have um, eyelids over the top of that, so it's going to be much smaller. So we're, we're basically, think of it as making the eye socket inside of a skull. That's what this black is representing and if you look at pictures of the zebra diker the eyes are quite big they won't be quite this big in the end but they will be pretty big so I just have all that tacked down I just wanted to kind of see how 
the head would look in relation to this body. Okay, I'm moving on from the head now. I'm going to get a little fur onto that tail and we're going to get a little fur onto the body. They always go through a stage where they look pretty alien. It's at some point you're you wonder what in the heck. <laughs> but you do enough of these, you do enough projects and you'll learn to recognize, oh, that means I'm halfway there. <laughs> when it looks crazy, keep going. You're on the right track. Because think about it, if you were to look at anatomy of humans or animals where they peel the skin away and you can see the muscles and everything underneath, it is pretty creepy and crazy looking underneath all that. So we're just building, building. If you get a good foundation when you get to the detail work, then it's really enjoyable seeing it all come together. And I have several of these cute little felting pillows that I've made. They come in so handy. You can make any size you need. They support your little critters. If you don't have anything like that, you could get an old sock and fill it with rice and tie the end. And use that as your support. I've done that before <laughs> in the beginning. So this color that I'm laying on here is the one that we hand carded of the Palomino and the um, Buck. Buck Pelt was the color of the uh, Redder. And those are hand carded bats from Serafina Fiber Art. So they already have mixtures of colors in them, but you can further mix them as well. I really love her house carded bats because they are already good to go for the most part. But I always also like to change the, um, the colors just a little bit by adding them to each other. and It's kind of like painting with wool. laying a layer on there and I got a little bit more to one side than the other side but that's not a big deal just filling in the spaces and I'm leaving the underbelly I'm not covering that with this color because the underbelly is staying the lighter color because their bellies are a lighter color And like I said before, there's no real rhyme or reason uh, the order that I do things in. I'm building layers, but I kind of work intuitively. So just whatever I feel needs worked on next is what I do next. So I felt like I wanted to get a little top coat on there. I wanted to see more of this animal filled out and coming to life.
So I'm going to go ahead and add some of the buck color. That's the darker of the two colors that we mix together. Later on when we go for the stripes, it, there's going to be a lighter color there where the stripes are, but and building up these colors, color variations, because in a natural coat you do have all of these subtle differences. Alrighty, that's it for today. It's getting exciting. Till next time.